Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Olivia Wilde, and welcome to the Physicians for Reproductive Health webinar. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here today because ever since the Roe decision the other day, I have felt um, a tremendous amount of um, compassion for the people who are really at the center of this issue, who are the physicians, the providers around our country. Um, I've been really wondering what they have to say about all this. There's a tremendous amount of information out there. And if you're like me, you've been ingesting it um, aggressively. And I'm really honored to have the opportunity here to speak directly to providers themselves to help us answer some questions that maybe we've all been having, but to give them a chance to address this. So uh, without further ado, I'll get out of the way. Um, I'd first love to introduce Dr. Jamila Parrott. Uh, Dr. Parrott, if you could just tell us a little bit about your practice and um, take us through what's been on your mind since the decision. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Olivia, for being with us today. We're really grateful for your longstanding partnership. And, and to everyone that's joining us, uh, thank you for spending your morning listening to physicians and advocates across the country share what we're seeing on the ground in this moment. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Dr. Jamila Parrott. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an OBGYN and a complex family planning specialist uh, in the DC area and also the president and CEO of Physicians for Reproductive Health. At PRH, we are a network of more than 440 um, trained physicians and also uh, a number of uh, of advocates and supporters out there who are really working to shift the conversation about reproductive health rights and justice, understanding that as physicians, we have an obligation, um, but also an opportunity uh, to really advance access to comprehensive reproductive health for the communities we care for. And we have spent really the last few weeks, and months and years awaiting the news that we received on Friday. Yes, as providers of abortion care and advocates for reproductive health and rights and justice, we all knew this was coming. We've seen the writing on the wall, but that doesn't make this moment any less devastating. Already from our providers on the ground, we're hearing troubling and cruel stories of people being denied access to care. We hear about the trigger ban, seeing people around the country who had their appointments for abortion care canceled some of whom were already at the clinic waiting to receive this care, who were instead sent home. Many will be forced to remain pregnant against their will by politicians who think they know better. Our fertility once again being controlled by the state. We're hearing of pregnant people being denied care for the management of life-threatening conditions like ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages, one woman, in fact, who was forced to wait nine hours for life-saving care while the physician at the hospital consulted with lawyers. During that wait, her fallopian tube ruptured and she almost died. But this is just one story. There will be countless more like it, told and untold in the days to come. As a practicing physician, I can remember the many patients I've cared for who would have lost their lives if I wasn't able to use my medical training to provide them with the care that they needed in that moment. The role of the state, the role of the government should never be to tell doctors what care they can provide. This isn't medicine. It doesn't happen for any other type of care, just abortion. The implications of this ruling are gonna impact patients and providers differently. And you'll hear from Drs. Kumar, Wilkinson, and McHugh, about some of their experiences in states where access to abortion is under attack and has been for decades. But I also wanna share what the impact this will have on communities who are working to proactively protect abortion care. We know that some patients, those who have the resources and support will travel to other places seeking care. We know that the pressure on clinics, staff and providers in those states like California, New York, New Mexico, Washington, New Jersey, just to name a few is immense. Denying access to abortion in one place has a ripple effect in others. The providers and the health centers that work to see people in need of care are having increasing waiting times for appointments and folks in these states are pushed out of their own communities, forced to travel as well. And we know that this is just the beginning. 
anti-abortion activists are not gonna stop here and we must be prepared to fight. In the days since the Dobbs decision was handed down, we've seen anti-abortion members of Congress lay out plans to issue a nationwide ban at the first chance that they get. Anti-abortion advocates in the states issuing model legislation to be used as a playbook in order to criminalize patients and providers for seeking care and anti-choice state officials vowing to ban mail order medication abortion and conflating contraception with abortion pills. Many of, of these bans are put in place under the guise of protecting women or concerns about safety. I wanna take a moment to remind you all how safe and effective medication abortion is, safer than many of the medications you can buy today over the counter or at your pharmacy. Mifepristone and mesoprostol, the medications we use for abortion are FDA approved, evidence-based medications that can safely end a pregnancy. And let's be clear, whether abortion is legal or illegal, people will still do everything in their power to access this care. The good news is that people have been self-managing their abortions for centuries. And, without the, and with the advent of the, the availability of these medications, we know that they can do so safely. The worry, the threat here is not around medical safety, but instead a legal one. Because of this and other community efforts to continue to get people the care that they need, we're going to see attempts to further criminalize abortion, to punish doctors, activists, supporters, and patients. Let's, no, make, no, let's make no mistake, overturning Roe and Casey are just the beginning. No one should be punished or criminalized for getting the essential care that they need. There is a lot of work to do, but that work can't solely be focused on preventing all of the bad things from happening and reinstating the protections provided by these court cases that were overturned on Friday. The protections provided by Roe were just the floor. And those protections have not been real for many communities for a long time. We know that abortion access has been non-existent were exceedingly difficult to obtain for many of the people we care for. Stigma, shame, harassment, political interference, all have conspired to ensure that this time-sensitive, essential health care is pushed out of reach. Roe versus Wade has never been enough. And now more than ever, the part that physicians must play to support access for our communities is critical. We need to use this moment to push for real access to abortion for anyone who needs it without shame, without restrictions, without interference. Today, you're gonna to get to hear from these other physicians and advocates who are on the front lines of this fight alongside me. I have worked with them for quite some time and am honored to call them colleagues and friends. Thank you all for being with us this morning. I look forward to answering your questions. Olivia, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Parrott. It is so inspiring to learn from the work you guys do at Physicians for Reproductive Health. And the reason that I've been a supporter for so long is because when we think of these clinics that have been struggling to survive in many of the states that have now uh, uh, been experiencing outright bans through these trigger laws or who soon will be, these providers who I've been able to meet through Physicians for Reproductive Health are those who are actually populating these clinics. I think people sometimes are uh, familiar with the clinics themselves or with organizations like Planned Parenthood. And I remember when I learned, well, the doctors who are actually working at those clinics are um, a community of people that are not only working extremely hard and have been for years to try to protect these basic rights, but are doing so in a, in a very dangerous environment. It's always been dangerous. So thank you for your bravery. Um, I'm really, really honored to be having a conversation with all of you. Next, I'd love to move to Dr. Bhavik Kumar. Dr. Kumar has been working in Texas, and I'd be really curious to hear about the work you've been doing, and specifically as you've been navigating SB8, um, the abortion ban in Texas. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Take it away. Thank you. Um, as Olivia said, my name is Dr. Bhavik Kumar. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a family medicine doctor and an abortion provider in Texas where I've been providing for over seven years now. Um, and it's an honor to share this space with my colleagues across the country, especially in this moment when community with those of us that do this work is more meaningful than ever. And thank you to each of you listening today and showing up because we need all of you to join this community that believes in bodily autonomy, believes in freedom and understands that access to abortion care is a human right. 
As an abortion provider in Texas, as Dr. Parrott said, I've known this moment was inevitable. The overturning of Roe was in the playbook for those who oppose abortion rights for some time now. Yet it's no less unsettling or heavy for me as we witness the devastating impact across the country. For many years now, I've seen useless, harmful, and aggressive restrictions on abortion care being passed year after year. I've seen firsthand from anti-abortion politicians the relentless and conniving attempts to harm the people I take care of. Unfortunately, what happens in Texas doesn't stay in Texas. In March of 2020, at the start of the global pandemic, a time that was full of uncertainty and fear, our governor in Texas and our attorney general decided to engage in a full-on attack on abortion care by issuing an executive order and then specifically naming abortion care uh, being banned. And this resulted in a month-long battle through the course as we sought to fight for our patients' right to access timely and essential care. During that time, our health center either opened or closed a total of eight times, which meant that there were several days when my patients were sent home still pregnant against their will. People who had taken time off of work had their support person with them, had arranged for childcare that day, and jumped over every barrier that the state had placed in front of them, and yet the government still intervened at the last minute, stripping them of their dignity and their autonomy. While we eventually prevailed with that legal effort around the executive order, it wasn't too long before we were facing yet another set of egregious anti-abortion laws, including Senate Bill 8, a law that bans abortion when cardiac motion can be detected on an ultrasound as early as the fifth week of pregnancy or as soon as 10 days after a missed period. This law has a novel enforcement mechanism that allows everyday people throughout the country to bring a lawsuit forward against anyone who aids or bets in abortion in Texas. And for the past almost 10 months, we've been doing our best to provide care in a world where Roe has very little meaning for us. During this time, we've drastically changed our operations to be able to help as many people as we can. And unfortunately, given the limited window of time, we've had to help thousands of people overcome the barriers required to travel out of state. We've seen firsthand that banning abortion never stops the need for abortion. We've partnered with Texas abortion funds and practical support orgs to help people navigate the complex barriers to obtaining care out of state. Unfortunately, we've also seen that for some people, this just isn't an option, and instead, they've been forced to carry a pregnancy to term against their will. All of this in a state that ranks 50th in terms of access to prenatal, pregnancy, and postpartum care, a state that refuses to expand postpartum Medicaid coverage to six months, and a state with inexplicably high maternal mortality rates, especially among Black women. As I wrap up here, I want to remind folks that for us at Planned Parenthood in Texas, while our, our ability to provide abortion care has drastically changed, we continue to provide comprehensive family planning care, access to contraception, cancer screenings, STI testing and treatment. We even provide gender care and primary care. And we'll continue to show up for the people that need us and we'll take care of them as they navigate a world where the government has failed them. Thank you again for being here and thanks so much for your support for Physicians for Reproductive Health. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. The people of Texas are very, very lucky to have you. And for those of you who are in states um, that have lost their rights to their own reproductive health, just know there's physicians like Dr. Kumar out there fighting for your rights. And thank you for that reminder that um, you know outlawing abortions does not in any way stop abortions. And I think we can use Texas as this um, template from which to learn what happens now. Once we've lost our rights, what can we do and how can we be most effective? So thank you, your experience is invaluable. Um, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tracy Wilkinson. She's a pediatrician in Indiana and a board member, member for Physicians for Reproductive Health. Dr. Wilkinson, I'll let you take it away. Thanks so much, Olivia. So I'm a pediatrician who uses she, her pronouns, and I fundamentally believe that young people should be trusted to make decisions about their own body. This pertains to everything in medicine, but especially when it comes to decisions about abortion. I live and work in Indiana, and despite being the unofficial capital of the anti-abortion movement, I actually love living here. I did think that living in Indiana and the work that I do around reproductive health care access would have given me some baseline preparedness for this moment. I thought that the countless times I've been at the state house testifying against abortion restrictions and losing the battle every single year would have made me stronger. I thought that the number of times I had been told that I was crazy for being scared that they would overturn Roe had made me immune to the actual feelings for when it happened. But none of that has made this moment less painful. 
Surprisingly, we are not a state that has a trigger law. And so at the moment, we are in a holding pattern, waiting for drafted legislation from our Republican supermajority, who are all fighting over who can be the most egregious with their restrictions to people's bodily autonomy. We're working our channels to advocate for our patients and try to make the ban less egregious, but the ban is coming right around the corner. I'm here today though to focus on minors. So in Indiana, if you're a minor that's seeking an abortion, you must have parental consent. And just last year, they added the requirement that that consent must be notarized for no medical purpose. However, I want to pay attention to the fact that our state is not alone when it comes to not trusting minors with these decisions. A total of 37 states require either parental notification or consent, sometimes both, prior to accessing an abortion. If parental consent is not possible, there is the option to get a lawyer and go in front of a judge to make the case, which is called a judicial bypass. And this doesn't take into account the cost of an abortion, the transportation that may be required to get an abortion, and all the additional logistical obstacles such as mandatory waiting periods and multiple appointments. We can anticipate that minors trying to access legal abortion will be faced with even more barriers as subsequent laws can further create penalties for minors and adults that help them. And that these, bar these barriers will be compounded by poverty and race, sexual orientation, gender presentation, and other social statuses. Young people already face obstacles to accessing comprehensive reproductive health care. It's vital that we keep minors access in mind as we troubleshoot and plan for the next phases of this battle. For example, telehealth platforms for medication abortion need to be accessible for youth. Many of the online companies do not serve minors. Therefore, we can't assume that all minors will be able to obtain consent and medication abortion through this mechanism. I also want to transition and take a quick moment to provide some clarification with regards to plan B and medication abortion. For years, we have battled misinformation and conflation of these two concepts, and the last few days in particular have escalated the amount of misinformation that's out there. It's imperative that everyone knows the difference and is able to correct the misinformation when they see it or they hear it. So I'm gonna give you a little primer. So first, plan B or emergency contraception and medication abortion are not the same thing. They are not the same medication. They do not contain, contain the same ingredients. Full stop. The most common form of emergency contraception is known by the name brand, plan B, although there are many generic versions out there. It contains levonorgestrel. It's taken up to five days after unprotected sex. It's available over the counter. It does not require a prescription and people of all ages should legally be able to access it. It primarily works by delaying ovulation. It does not cause an abortion. It does not cause bleeding. In fact, if you take plan B when you're pregnant, nothing happens because it's the same hormone that your body is making to maintain a pregnancy. Of note, there is a prescription form of emergency contraception that is called Ella. It is more efficacious over time and when a patient has a higher BMI. Intrauterine devices or IUDs can also be used as emergency contraceptions contraception and they don't have concerns about BMI and efficacy over time, but you do need to take in mind that you have to get that place within five days after an unprotected sex um, occurrence, which can be very challenging. A medication abortion consists of two medications called mesoprostol and mifepristone. In the United States, you can only obtain these medications by a prescription. And not surprisingly, states with abortion restrictions often have restrictions about how this medication is dispensed and available. Despite the FDA removing some of these restrictions recently, states like my own still require in-person dispensing only from a physician. I wanna remind everyone that the anti-abortion movement has been fighting the long game for 50 years to get to this moment. They have been focused disciplined, relentless, and strategic. It is not an accident that this decision throws access to legal abortion back to states, and there are many Republican-controlled state legislatures. Now is the time that we all have to collectively fight. We have to fight for the people today that have insurmountable barriers to access to abortion, for the people that have lost and will lose in the subsequent months. We have to fight for the marginalized and minoritized communities that already face barriers of systemic racism in addition to all the abortion access barriers. And we have to remember that this fight includes minors and that they have the capacity and ability to make decisions about their own bodies. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Wilkinson. I, young people are so lucky to have you as an advocate. I find it really shocking that many young people don't have access to these telehealth, um, you know, to be able to use telehealth uh, to, to ask questions even, specifically to be aided in medicated abortions. I think that's something that's so important. Um, and when we get to the question portion, which is after um, our next physician speaks, then I'd love to ask a little bit more about that. Um, but um, last but very much not least, we have Katie McHugh. Dr. McHugh is also in Indiana and an OBGYN as well as an abortion provider. Dr. McHugh, take it away. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for being here, Olivia. And I'm so honored to be here with my colleagues. I am um, a queer OBGYN in Indiana, and I am honored to be here today to speak on behalf of those of us in the community and in red states. Um, this is a tricky time, as we all know. On Friday, when the decision was uh, released and handed down, I was working in one of my clinics, one of my um, places where I provide abortion care. And it was as if a wave or a, a strong wind blew through the clinic. It was like a gut punch to all of us, patients, physicians, staff members, our security folks, everyone felt just a moment of despair as we could feel our rights and our autonomy being stripped away from us. It was an incredible moment, um, a terrible moment. And then the moments that followed were ones of community and ones of coming together in solidarity and in love. And that's always where I want to come back when we're talking about abortion. Abortion is an act of love. Abortion is an act of compassion, and it is a, a moment and a decision in a person's life that is made out of self-love and self-interest, and that should be paramount. And I know all of you on this session know that and feel that, but I want to see that in you and validate that in you, and thank you for being here and being a part of this community. When we come together in community with a single-minded focus, we can make a difference and we can make good, effective changes. And that's what I've been seeing from all of my colleagues and all of my friends in this work and around this work. People are coming together to fundraise, to coordinate, to collaborate, to bring together evidence-based medicine and experience with the logistical resources that patients and providers need to come together and get people the care that they so deserve. I am honored to be a part of this community, but I am also obligated by my oath as a physician to care for others and as my morals and ethics guide me to be a helpful and useful person in service of others. When I read about the challenges that folks are facing in treating ectopic pregnancies, as Dr. Parrott mentioned earlier, or in the delivering of uh, Plan B, like um, Dr. Wilkinson was talking about, uh, I am horrified and devastated for both the patients and the providers that are, are dealing with these things. So one thing I would like to also validate is the secondary injury, the, the moral injury that we are all experiencing. When we go to school and we train for years and we have the skills and the knowledge and the experience to treat someone the way that they need to be treated and we can't because we might be imprisoned or charged with a felony or fined more than we make in a year and it endangers our families and our loved ones, that, that juxtaposition and that absolute injury to our spirit, that is what I worry about the most. How do we get through that moment? What do you do? How do you spend nine hours watching someone who you know is bleeding and you know has a hemorrhaging ectopic pregnancy and sleep at night? So I'm here to validate that as well. We as a community are here for each other. So we need to rely on each other. We need to come together 
as we have done before, but in new ways, in innovative ways that will not only just fundraise and, and raise awareness, but will support each other's spirits and lift each other up. We are not here, I'm not here as a queer person or as an OBGYN or as an abortion provider. I am here as a person who deserves my own bodily autonomy. And I see that in you all as well. We all deserve that. And I'm here to fight for you. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. McHugh. Your passion is really infectious. And um, I, I uh, applaud your um, willingness to acknowledge what I imagine must be difficult in these times. You all do so much for others and the community you have amongst yourself must be so intact, particularly now when I imagine there will need to be so much coordination between states um, and uh, many providers are probably wondering how they can work uh, to help those in states that are now um, facing these bans. I'm, I'm amazed by the camaraderie and I wanna know so much more about it and how we as non-physicians, as just advocates can help all the work you guys are doing. I want to move to some of the questions um, that we've received just to make sure we get to them. The first one is for you, Dr. Parrott. You're a practicing OBGYN. You've cared for all kinds of people, including those who do want to carry their pregnancies to term. You and the folks um, also working on these issues work on maternal mortality as an issue. Can you speak a little bit about how uh, the issue of maternal mortality is related to that of abortion care? Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that I think is it's important to, to point out whenever we're talking about abortion care is that it doesn't occur in a vacuum, right? Often we talk about abortion as if it were separate from every other part of people's lives. And it just doesn't. That's not the way it works. You know, we know that most people who have abortions are already parents. Uh, they know what it means to, to parent their children. And for the folks that I talk to who I provide abortions for, um, when they're talking about their decision, the number one reason why people are seeking abortion care is because they want to care for the children they already have. When we think about these restrictions in particular um, and who they will impact, it's important to, to also acknowledge that uh, prior to the legalization of abortion in 1973, people had abortions. People had safe abortions. Wealthy people had safe abortions. Resourced people had safe abortions. People who could travel had safe abortions. And those were most likely to be white women. Those without resources, without money, without the ability to travel had unsafe abortions or carried their pregnancies to term. We aren't in that strict binary now because of the advent of medication abortion, it is possible to manage your own abortion outside of the medical system in places where it's restricted. And we talked a little bit about legality and safety not being so deeply connected. But when we think about who is at greatest risk when these abortion bans play out, we know that it's women of color, women and birthing people of color, young people who Dr. Wilkinson mentioned, LGBTQ folks, undocumented people. These are the same communities that have greater rates of maternal mortality. There is a through line here. So forcing pregnancy for someone who is clearly identified that they are unable or incapable or do not desire to carry this pregnancy to term increases the risk of poor health outcomes. We have robust data to show that, that folks who have sought pregnancy care and who have sought, I'm sorry, abortion care and were turned away um, have negative outcomes, economic outcomes, educational attainment, the health and well-being of their children, but also health outcomes. When we overlay these bands with maternal mortality, the folks that are right at the center of this conversation are Black and Indigenous women, period. We are going to see increased rates of maternal mortality and morbidity for Black and Indigenous women as these abortion bans continue to play out. But make no mistake, this isn't tied to our race. It's not because I'm Black that I'm at a greater risk of dying during pregnancy and, and in the postpartum period, three to four chances greater than white women. But it is because of the structural and institutional racism embedded in all of our systems, including our health system in this country. It is 
racism, not race, that puts us at risk. It is racism, not race, that puts us at risk of being disproportionately and inequitably impacted by these bans. We have to always talk about these things together. We talk about the human right to have children and to parent the children that we have in safe communities and the human right not to have children and the human right to bodily autonomy, all things that are part of the reproductive justice framework. We have to talk about pregnancy and postpartum care and abortion in the same breath. Wow, thank you for that. And I, you know, you mentioned stigma before, and I imagine that's also part of this conversation because for those who are forced to carry their pregnancies to term, I imagine that's a very difficult conversation to have once you are caring for a child to acknowledge that perhaps it wasn't at all advantageous to you, to the child, to the rest of the family. At that point, the immense sense of guilt for those women must also prevent a thorough investigation of what actually happens when we force women to have children, those who do survive. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. That's a tough one, right? Because uh, we don't want to suggest that because someone has sought abortion care and been able to, uh, uh, unable to obtain it, that we don't love our children. We do, right? right? Um, and so it's important that we always lift that up too. But we can, both things can be true at the same time. We can say that if, if circumstances were different, I would not have carried this pregnancy to term. I cannot parent the way that I want. Or we know that folks are more likely to be tied to an abusive partner uh, when they sought abortion care and had not. So circumstances, abortion doesn't occur out of context. It's not in a vacuum. Right. And so we continue to love the children that we have and we deserve to raise them in resource environments. That's the thing, the resource environment issue, of course, yeah. providing family leave. I mean, it, it's, it's if, particularly if we're gonna force people to have these children, how can we then not assist them and care for those kids and those and just women? Just one other thing with that in mind, like it's important to understand that that's why we have to say over and over, this has never been about abortion. This has never been about protecting life. Because if that were true, then the structures and the resources to support our families, to give us the ability to survive beyond pregnancy and the postpartum period, that is the least of what we're asking, survival. We deserve mm -hmm. to thrive, right? Mm -hmm. This has never been about life. This is about power. This is about control. I think that's really helpful as everyone's now having these conversations and, you know, helping people with language to be able to discuss what's actually at the heart of this issue. It's not about life. It's not about babies. This is about power. Um, I want to move to our next question so people can feel like their concerns are addressed. This is for Dr. McHugh. How can providers and advocates in states with abortion access best help those in bordering states, for example, Illinois, New York? Oh, that's such a good question. So I'm in Indiana, as I said earlier, and um, one of the most common questions I get now is, so are you going to leave Indiana because you can no longer do your work here? And absolutely not. This is my home and these are my people and the, the people that I live with and love are here in this state. And so what I, one of the things I would ask of folks in quote unquote friendlier states um, or states with protections um, is to not forget about us in the red states and forget about those of us who are still doing the work in the red states. Um, so that is not just um, about facilitating transportation of patients from one place to the other. It's also supporting the people who are on the ground and still doing the work in these states. It's fundraising for the folks who are in these states. The other um, piece of that that I would like to highlight is that, um, as was mentioned earlier, this is not the end of the attacks on abortion access. Just because uh, abortion will be banned shortly in my state and is, ba is already banned in some of my neighboring states does not mean that Illinois is going to be safe forever. The national ban is coming and that fight is coming. So we cannot become complacent or feel safe in the state's uh, just because of the work that has already been done. We, can, we have already seen just in the last week how the work we do gets undone by federal intervention. So the folks who are in the protected places have to double down, have to redouble efforts uh, to not only prevent further interference, but 
enhance protections, become uh, a national movement for um, access to abortion and, and funding abortion um, transportation and care. So those are the, the areas that I would really like to highlight. Don't forget about us in the places where it's become difficult to provide care and don't think that this fight is over for you. Thank you so much. Can I ask a, a, a follow-up to that really quickly? Um, for those states that don't have the bans, presumably those clinics will be overrun at this point. Is it advantageous to have uh, physicians who are working in states or who are now working in states with the bans spend time traveling to states where it's still legal to be able to support those clinics? Is that helpful? Or is it, as you said, best to stay in the state and work on the ground supporting the work that's still being done? That's such a great question. You are so good. Such a great question. So one answer to that is that there are some states that have telemedicine abortion options. That is a great way for those of us in states that we can't provide abortion anymore to be able to offset some of the influx of patients into those other states. So for example, I'm in Indiana, but I'm in the process of getting a Maryland license and a New Mexico license um, and a Minnesota license because in those states, I can provide telemedicine abortion from Indiana to patients in those states. And that helps the folks who are doing the work in those states uh, because they don't have to see those patients. I can see those patients remotely. That is not going to fix the problem, but it does help offset some of that influx. Other options are, just as you mentioned, traveling to those other states and working in those clinics. That is a longer process because we have to add days. We need to become credentialed. We need to get medical licenses, all of those things. And yes, that may be very helpful. Uh, so reaching out at this point and figuring out where the need is, what the need is, and how we can help fill that need, all, all great ideas. And then still, there's still work to be done on the ground in our, in our homes and, and with our neighbors and our community here. Thank you, thank you. That answers that perfectly. I was really wondering that. Um, our next question is for Dr. Wilkinson. As a pediatrician in the state of Indiana, what should I be working on now? My neighbor is asking me about misoprostol versus mifepristone. I know we will all become very uh, fluent in saying these words very soon versus plan B. Should I be prepared to be able to answer these questions or maybe even acquire these medications to distribute to my community or should I defer to existing resources? Will those resources even continue to exist? Um, great question, Olivia. So what I would say is that all of us, if you are a clinician or a non-clinician, you're just a human being, you need to get ready to start talking about this and be able to explain this. Um, obviously, those of us that have gone through training might be able to do so a little bit more easily with like brushing up on our pharmacology lessons, but everybody needs to be able to just stop these misinformations from being perpetuated. It can lead to serious consequences for our patients in our communities. Um, and we are already hearing legislatures conflating them and putting them into state legislation, which is devastating. And that could mean real impacts for birth control access, including IUDs and plan B um, at a state level. Um, as a pediatrician, I would say that all clinicians, no matter what your specialty is, you need to be making sure that you are providing contraception action, access and pregnancy option counseling. No matter what your specialty is, this is within the scope of any medical provider. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is my home institution, just updated guidelines on Friday, very conveniently, on both of these topics. Um, so I encourage you to read them regardless of your specialty because what applies to our patients in pediatrics should be applying to everyone. Um, and then in terms of community resources, I think it's really important to know who in your community is providing this care and help your patients navigate um, around the barriers to get to that care. But also make sure that you are engaging these partners, um, making sure that you are supporting them and collaborating with them and not focused on creating like another system of care right behind you. Um, and then for all providers, I wanted to also encourage, you know, advanced provision of emergency contraception. Talk about it with every single patient. I, as a pediatrician, I prescribe it often um, because if I prescribe it, there are less questions at the pharmacy when a minor presents for, for it. Um, it is much more likely to be there when they go. 
Um, and the cost can sometimes be covered by Medicaid or insurance plans. So even in Indiana, Plan B is covered by Medicaid. And with the over-the-counter cost being between $40 and $50, that's a lot of money for a minor to have, even a non-minor to have. And so I talk to all of my patients. We have a Plan A, but we also have a Plan B. No matter what birth control method you're using, let's make sure you know about this. And I talk about it with every gender. This is not something that should only be put on people of a certain gender. Um, this is really something that we need to start changing in um, our medical field to say that comprehensive reproductive health care access should be done by everyone, not just a niche of medical providers, which is what is part of like why we're here. Um, this has been allowed to become a niche, you know, specialty and it should never have been. I, it makes all the sense in the world. I imagine it's also conversations with parents to remove the stigma to help them have those conversations so that young people don't feel yet another barrier and even communicating about or even asking questions about any kind of emergency contraception or medicated abortions with their families. I know parents probably are sort of struggling with what counts as um, being a good parent, how can be responsible. So hearing it from a pediatrician that no, it is very responsible to um, help them have access to this care, uh, that that would be such a valuable conversation to have. I will move on um, to, let's see, um, Dr. Kumar. As abortion providers in states currently banning abortion care or which will be enacting further restrictions soon, how do you suggest we get involved in the advocacy efforts to change policies? How can our expertise be best put to use in these arenas? Thank you for that question. I think uh, fortunately a lot of folks are trying to get involved, which is great. Um, I think the best thing to do is to start with the folks that are already doing the work on the ground. They're, are a number of organizations and states, whether they're restrictive states or um, haven states that are doing the work already. Um, you could start with abortion funds and practical support orgs. And if you don't know which orgs are already in your state, you can go through the national network of abortion funds to find out which orgs are doing the work and whether that's donating or volunteering time or just staying connected uh, with what their needs may be, that's probably the best place to start. And then um, aside from community orgs, uh, more locally, I think staying connected with the national orgs, physicians for reproductive health, um, and numerous other national orgs are doing the work that often have impact in states that are restricted as well. Um, so staying connected with what's going on with them, even just signing up for emails and, and knowing what needs may come up with time is very, very important. It may seem trivial, but it's important. And the more folks are connected to this network of uh, orgs, the more powerful these orgs can be in, in responding and having your voice um, um, recognized in the work that they do. Um, and then I think anytime it comes to leveraging expertise or resources that you may have or anything that you may want to offer to the work, I think it's important to always center the needs of the folks that are trying to access care. Um, understandably, a lot of us may be thinking, what can I do? How can I use my knowledge or how can I use this, that or the other to, to make things better? And I think the effort and um, the desire to do all those things is understandable, but sometimes it may miss what the actual need is. So think about what the need is, who is trying to access care and center those folks in that. Um, if there are physicians or other folks with expertise that want to offer, uh, you know, whether it's resources or access to something that you may have, let folks know about that. And, and when it, if and when it's needed, I think folks will reach out, um, but always center the folks that are most needed and don't try to recreate the wheel. There's probably folks already doing the work that have been doing it for years, if not decades. So organize with them, get connected with them and ask them what they need and respond to that. Thank you for bringing up that issue of redundancy. This is not the time to launch a new advocacy organization. There are so many who've been working for so long and it's just about educating ourselves on who's doing the work and asking them what they need. Um, okay, Dr. McHugh. How are the next generation of medical students and residents going to be trained in abortion care if they're in a state where abortion is now illegal? What's your advice for someone training in a state with a trigger ban who wants to become an abortion provider? I think you're muted. Sorry, I got excited. Um, <laughs> that's such an important issue. Um, it is so important for everyone to at least be trained in the basics and you know as an OBGYN it is part of our required curriculum that we are trained and 
competent in managing both um, abortion and miscarriage, as well as the complications um, that can arise from those. Um, so this is a huge issue. It's a logistical issue, but it's also an ethical and a moral issue because we are going to see this. It is a natural part of, um, of our profession that we will see this. And so we must be trained in, uh, to be able to offer that care and provide that care to, to patients. So there are some different opportunities. Certainly traveling is going to be a part of that and is going to be, um, at least in the short term, one of the best ways uh, to get hands-on experience. Um, there have been conversations that I've been a part of already trying to expand funding efforts to get medical students and residents um, from states where abortion is now very restricted or banned to states where it is protected um, and accessible. So trying to navigate that, but just like patients, medical students and physicians and residents all have families and obligations. We have pets, we have houses, you know, we have things to do in our homes. So leaving our homes to seek out training um, is very challenging. So looking at funding sources, looking at fundraising for those purposes will be important. Um, webinars and trainings and uh, courses will also be important, less for the hands-on piece, but more for management and learning algorithms um, and learning what is possible. I also very much recommend that people do a lot of education um, for themselves as far as what is available to patients without our interaction. So um, self-managed abortion is a very, very important piece of what we are looking at in this post-Roe world. Um, and it's something that didn't exist in the pre-Roe era. So self-managed abortion is, um, is an option for many people, not everybody, but many people. Uh, so for physicians, we need to know about that. We need to know how to manage any complications or, um, or incomplete treatments that come in. So the more we can educate ourselves about what is available to patients, the better we will be able to help them. So for example, um, I would recommend people um, visit plancpills.org and um, aidaccess.org. There's also the um, M what is it? Um, the MNA hotline, MA hotline, um, which goes through different, uh, both complications and also experiences of people experiencing both abortion and miscarriage. So look for um, educational resources outside of standardized curriculum, because this is going to be a project for all of us to work on together. Wow, that's incredibly helpful. Um, thank you. Uh, we have two more questions that I want to make sure are addressed. First is for Dr. Perez. How can one find help and trust that they will not be turned in by healthcare workers? What about data mining from all digital devices? Is HIPAA out the window now? So really, really critical. And I'm glad to be able to respond to that right after Dr. McHugh's last um, response, because those websites are amazing and they are also opportunities for criminalization and put people at risk. And so what we know that, you know, more than 20 people have already been arrested uh, and jailed for suspicion of managing their own abortion. And most of the information that has been used against them have come from two places. One, from data mining, Google searches, tracking phones, right? All of those apps have got to go. All the period tracking apps, all of those things are collecting your data. All your Google searches, all of that is being weaponized against folks in order to punish and criminalize them for suspicion of managing their abortion. It does not even have to be proven or guaranteed. And managing your own abortion is not illegal in most states. I think that there are three or four left where it's actually illegal. So these prosecutors are using everything but the kitchen sink and throwing that at, at providers, at patients who are criminalizing them. So data access is huge. The second thing that puts people at risk is seeking medical care. People who have shown up to seek care from their providers, sometimes just with a question, have then had the police called on them and they have been 
interrogated, imagine bleeding, miscarrying in the emergency room and having a, a, a police interrogation at your bedside. So the piece that Dr. McHugh was mentioning, the importance of educating providers is critical. There is no mandatory reporting law. There is no reason, there's no reason to call the police on your patients ever anyway, period. But especially around self-managed abortion. And it is in fact a violation of our privacy laws and certainly our ethical oath as medical providers. The leading medical organization, the American College of OBGYN, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, all American Public Health Association, all have come out saying that doctors should not be acting as agents of the state. Asking doctors to interrogate our patients about what they may have taken, what they may have done prior to seeing us, it breaks the trust from providers and people will not seek care. It is against public health principles. So if you're a healthcare provider, one, don't call the police, right? And refuse to collude. We do not have to turn over data. We do not have to turn over medical records. We do not have to testify. We do not have to participate in these efforts. I will say one other thing that, you know, it, some, of the, some of the folks, the medical providers who have um, called the police on patients for suspicion of self-managed abortion have done so out of malice, for sure. Right. Others, it's confusion. And that's why this ed this education is important. Right. Not should we call? Is this mandatory reporting? I don't know what we should do. Let me just call a social worker or let me just call the police just in case. Right. That is not needed. It's not necessary. And in fact, causes harm on the patient side of thing. It is important to know that there is no medical test that can prove whether or not you tried to induce your own abortion with these medications. There's no blood test. There's no nothing we can run. You have the right to share as much or as little information as you think is appropriate. And it almost never changes the way we would care for you if you were having a miscarriage or if you had taken these medications to induce an abortion. If you are being interrogated, if you are concerned that you are at risk for criminalization, check out the If When How legal helpline. They also have a legal defense fund where their sole job is to help defend and protect people who have been accused of managing their own abortion or have being punished or criminalized for pregnancy loss. Because it isn't just abortion. People who are having miscarriages are looped into this as well. Wow. Wow. That's really um, unbelievable. That's I'm taking that in. Uh, I want to get to our last question. Dr. Kumar, what suggested next steps do you have for individuals in states restricting and banning who are fearful for their right to health care? Thanks for that question. Um, I think for me as an abortion provider in Texas, fear is certainly not a foreign concept, especially in today's world. Um, and it's difficult to navigate. And I think we all navigate it in our own ways. But I think the first thing to do is to acknowledge what you're feeling, acknowledge that you're fearful. Um, for some of that, for some of us that manifest in emotions, for some of us, we feel physical things when we're feeling fearful and name all of those things that you're feeling and just naming it can be a start. Um, the way I navigate fear is I've moved into a place of, of rem reminding myself that I can't be frozen in that fear. Being frozen or sitting in that fear doesn't serve me, doesn't serve the people that I'm trying to take care of. Um, it's not always easy to move into action but that's where I feel the most useful and powerful and fear, feel like I'm overcoming that fear. Um, and so if folks are able to do that, I would encourage you to move into action if you feel safe doing so, if you feel like you're able to. Um, and that can change with time. Sometimes there's times when I'm more fearful or less fearful and more active and less active. And, and that's all OK, because we're all in this together. I think actionable steps are to stay informed. We certainly had a lot of information shared today, and hopefully folks are feeling more informed than when they came in. Um, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of folks doing the work already. Stay engaged with those orgs. Um, we've shared some resources for folks that may be fearful about legal implications. Certainly, If How When has a lot of great information. Um, check out the website. Familiarize yourself with these resources. So if somebody else asks you about what they can do, where they can access information, you already are familiar with those things. Stay connected and lean into community. I can't emphasize that more than anything else. And that's certainly something that helps me you're not alone, um, knowing that there's other people out there that are probably feeling very similar things to what you're feeling, that there are other people doing the work, lean into that community and let us all do the work together. 
And the last thing I would just say is that, um, you know, don't lose sight of this world that we all want, this world that we know we deserve. The fight isn't over. The overturning of Roe is, is not the end of everything. Things may get worse, but we're in this together. And this world that we know can exist, we still have to manifest that. And so I would just encourage everyone to recognize the fear, name the fear, but don't lose sight of where we're going. Absolutely. Thank you for that, too. Uh, to be energized by the fear as opposed to paralyzed uh, is so important. And um, as Dr. Parrott mentioned before, you know, this is an issue that uh, has been uh, for so long um, sort of um, not addressed even by Roe that, you know, this isn't about a nostalgic, you know, we're trying to get back, oh, we want Roe back. It's never been good enough. So in turning that energy that comes from a fear-based place into a uh, motivation to create a law, create a series of laws that are much better than what the protection we all had under Roe, um, I find very, very inspiring. And, and Dr. Parrott, I want to allow you to close, and, and I, I hope you can incorporate into your closing just if there was one thing that you would really like us to take away from this. My community is wondering, how, how can we be most supportive of physicians, for, for, for providers? How can we protect you? What can we do to be most helpful? So please let us know. And um, I want you to close it out. So I'll just say now, thank you for having me. It's been an honor. And I uh, look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much, Olivia. And, and thank you, a big thank you to all the listeners who joined us and those of you who asked questions. Uh, when I think about what my takeaway is, you've heard um, many of the doctors on this webinar today say it over and over again, uh, and to speak about the importance of community. I feel really so lucky to work along these physicians uh, who sit on the PRH board, but also so many others in this fight, and to have the support and, and community for from all of you who are here today. You know, being in and of community is not just something that I value, but for me, it's an absolute necessity. It makes me a better doctor. It makes me a better human. Having an advocacy home at PRH and a community of other people fighting for our liberation is what enables me and so many others to continue to do this work. Community is a rejection of the lies that work to convince us that we're isolated and alone, powerless and small, because this is simply not the case. Our togetherness, our call back to community is one of many clarion calls to engagement and action. Holding tightly to community in times of turmoil is a radical thing. I know that it is, in, it is only in community where we'll find strength and resilience, where we'll be reminded of who we are, but more importantly, whose we are. In community, we're called back to our deepest selves, the self that not only carries the weight of grief and suffering, but also the power of healing. As healthcare providers, this is what we've been called to do. The radical poet Luc Lucille Clifton wrote that each day something that loves us tries to save us. And for me, that something is community. We're up against so much. This is, as Dr. Kumar said, gonna be a time filled with fear and with pain, but we can because we must harness this energy to rebuild and to forge ahead to something better, a future where we all get to be free. This work is critical. We, we at PRH appreciate your support and hope that you remain engaged in the ways that you can. The road ahead is long and the fight will be difficult, but we are in community and of community and, and that's what we've got. We've got us.